Like it or not, the senior and elderly population is vulnerable to negligence committed by medical professionals, nursing home and assisted living facilities, pharmaceutical and medical device companies, insurance companies, and everyday individuals and businesses. The Injured Senior Podcast is here to help. Steve Heisler is the creator of the National Injured Senior Law Center and has been advocating for seniors' rights for over 20 years. You have questions, and Steve Heisler has answers. This is the Injured Senior Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Stephen Heisler, founder and CEO of the National Injured Senior Law Center, and coming to you from steamy Baltimore, Maryland. You are tuned in to the Injured Senior Podcast, where we educate and discuss issues of importance to the injured senior and elderly population, as well as the children and loved ones of the injured senior and elderly population. I am your humble host, and I am very glad to be here. So our topic today is urgent care centers and whether they are safe for the senior and elderly population. And when I say urgent centers, it's those medical clinics that you see, they're popping up like weeds, they're all over the place. We're seniors, so back when, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, there were no urgent care centers, there was just the emergency room. So times have definitely changed. Here's a statistic, the number of urgent care centers in the U.S., has now exceeded 9,000, according to the Urgent Care Association. Wow, that's a lot of urgent care centers. Also, according to the Urgent Care Association's 2019 benchmarking report, the number of centers has increased steadily each year from 2013, when the total number of urgent care centers was 6,100. So yeah, this is definitely a thing of the 2000s, urgent care centers for all intents and purposes, did not exist back in the 1900s or not to the level that it is now. So why have they become so popular? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is convenience. Patients, they just don't want to wait the long hours. They like the fact that they can just walk in and get seen. So that is very appealing to people because when you wait in the emergency room, It depends on what hospital you go to, but a lot of hospitals, you're going to wait four to five hours. And that is just, I mean, that's insane. It's also cheaper than emergency rooms. And urgent care centers offer more services than your primary care physician, like IVs, they do stitches, they handle fractures. You know, my kids, they have not known a world without urgent care centers. They're millennials. So millennials, you know, they're, they're basically relatively healthy and they only have a, a couple of health emergencies a year. They comprise 25% of all urgent care visits a year. Now, according to a 2015 PNC Healthcare Consumer Survey, 85% of seniors go to their primary care physician first. Only 11% go to an urgent care center. So urgent care centers are growing, and seniors and elderly are visiting urgent care centers, and the trends are indicating that this will increase. And it, it begs the question, is it safe for seniors and elderly who oftentimes uh, have life-threatening situations and issues, and are urgent care centers appropriate for them to go to? So here to discuss these issues is Dr. Joseph Grillo out of the great state of Rhode Island. Dr. Grillo is a board-certified internal medicine and infectious disease physician with 20 years of experience. He's owned several urgent care centers himself. He's presently the president of Joseph Grillo Medical Legal Consulting. Dr. Grillo, how you doing? Thank you for coming on today. How, how are things going up in Rhode Island today? They're going well, Steve. Thanks for having me. It's not a problem. Not a problem. Is it okay if I call you Joe? Please do. All right. 
So you've got an interesting backstory. You're a doctor, an infectious disease, an internist, and you then went to law school and are an attorney as well. But I really want to focus on the urgent care centers. When, when did you actually become involved with urgent care centers? At what point in your life did you start uh, purchasing urgent care centers? Well, around when I finished fellowship, I began to practice and realized, well, I, I kind of knew this, but infectious disease docs are at the low end of the pay scale for physicians. And that combined with student loan debt, that sort of thing, made me interested in seeing how I might be able to mitigate this set of circumstances. And it happened that urgent cares were up and coming at the time. There was not one in my hometown. So that kind of got the ball rolling, and that's how I got interested. The, the concept that I had was that, look, I can open an urgent care center, and it's a great facility. It has a lab. It has an x-ray. It has a DEXA scan, all kinds of equipment and services that you need. And I could put my private practice within the urgent care facility itself and hire others when necessary to actually do the urgent care end of things. So that was how I went into it. And pretty much that's how it ended up uh, working out. Now, did you see a lot of seniors? And, And by the way, how many at your peak, how many centers did you have? Two. Okay, so you had had a couple. And did you see seniors and elderly patients? Yes, quite a few, actually. Okay, and my reading of the the research that's available is that seniors and elderly prefer to go to their primary care doctor before anything else. Is that accurate or, or does that make sense to you? Oh, absolutely. And why is that, you think? Well, that's where the trust lies. That's where people feel most comfortable is with the the physician that they have a relationship with. That makes a lot of sense. In fact, I was reading another article, I think it was in the Washington Post, which highlighted the fact that emergency rooms are actually... Well, they're a negative experience for everyone, but especially for seniors because they can be so chaotic and seniors can feel a loss of control or can literally get panic attacks or get more symptoms because of all the all the craziness that's going on in these emergency rooms. Oh, absolutely. If you just take the fact that an elderly person is going to have to sit in a plastic chair for four hours or so. Or lay on a gurney. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. But even before the gurney, they're sitting in the waiting room oftentimes if they're not emergent. And um, that wait can be many hours. And elderly people and hard chairs don't mix together well. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. All right. So the elderly and senior population are going to their primary care doctors. And you made a really good point that they have the trust and they have the relationship with their primary care doctor. But then did you start seeing some of those seniors and and elders either coming over from their primary care doctor or just circumventing the primary care doctor and coming right to urgent care? Well, uh, both, actually. Probably... The most common was their primary care sending their patient over to me, over to be seen in the urgent care because the primary wanted the patient, for example, to be seen, eyes on, and they weren't available. Or they wanted some ancillary service that we provided, such as an x-ray, a chest x-ray, for example, and their office didn't have that. We could do the x-ray and read it for them. So what do you what would you say was probably the most common 
issue that seniors and elders were coming in with? The two biggies were upper respiratory bronchitis or pneumonia even, and urinary tract, urinary tract infection, that sort of thing. So they were coming in via their primary care doctor with UTI and with upper respiratory? Well, that's often the case, but very often as well as they come in of their own accord into the urgent care. Okay. And you're an infectious disease physician. I'm sure you know that UTIs can be a really serious matter, as well as obviously upper respiratory. I mean, pneumonia is about as bad as it gets for a senior or aging individual. So would would you see them kind of like in the nick of time? Do you have to send a lot of them over to the ER? Or what would you do when they came in? Well, it kind of depended. You know, urinary tract infection, if it was simple, and it hadn't progressed to a point where the patient was bacteremic, you could treat it in the urgent care with perhaps a dose of IV antibiotics and follow that with um, discharge them with a prescription for oral antibiotics. That would work fine most of the time. However, if it was more advanced and the patient was becoming bacteremic or even septic, you know, their life depends on early intervention, you know, immediate intervention with IV antibiotics. So so the first task would be to get a dose of IV antibiotics on board and then to ship them to the hospital where their treatment needed to, an IV treatment needed to be continued. Okay. So we can kind of take for granted that if they come in for a sprain or, you know, a minor fracture or maybe a minor burn or a rash or something like that, a cold, that it's pretty hard for the urgent care to screw that up. I'm sure they do, you know, it it, it happens, but for the most part that can get dealt with and they can get them patched up and get them out of their uh, safe and sound. But you're mentioning UTIs and upper respiratory infections, and those are serious matters. And as you said, if uh, you give them the IV antibiotics in a more serious situation and get them to the ER. And the reason we have you on the show today is because I think that you're less than enamored with what has been going on with urgent care centers and using the situation where you've got something which can be serious with a senior and aging person. What is it about the urgent care centers, which I don't know if it's often, but you've seen that maybe they haven't gotten the best care coming in and these UTIs or upper respiratory tracts were not dealt with properly. Is that is that correct? I've seen that, yes. Okay. You want to tell our injured senior community a little bit about the problem that you're finding with urgent care centers? Sure. Well, it, it begins with this. Many people recognize that urgent care centers can be profit centers. They can be very profitable. And it's a way of being profitable that doesn't require the investor physician to be doing everything to generate income. In other words, he owns urgent cares and they produce income for him. Now, the issue comes about when the physician owner tries to you know, run too many centers. And what he does is he hires what we known as physician extenders. Physician extenders are people such as physician assistants and nurse practitioners. Now, the law is that as long as the physician is present someplace within the state and available by phone, that the PA or the NP can basically act autonomously. And when they have issue or question, they can phone the physician. And not to interrupt you, but you said the the law, and you're talking about in the state of Rhode Island or nationally? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's driven by statute, but most states have statutes that define 
the scope of practice for physician extenders. Okay. But in your situation in Rhode Island, the physician extenders could operate as long as the doctor was within the the state and was available by phone? Correct. Okay. And what that often meant is that, you know, one set of urgent cares, one, one group that owned eight or nine urgent cares had one doctor and maybe 15 or 16 extenders acting at any given time. Okay. And as a result of that, what did you see occurring? Well, as a result, it, it, the net effect was roughly that the extender was acting almost completely um, on his own. You know, that if something, if a case came in that was serious, the extender who was on his own would first have to recognize that he had a serious case. And then after recognizing it, would have to phone the physician to get help. And that's very unlikely to happen in, you know, in clinical practice in reality. Well, I'm sure that when you ran your urgent care center that that was not the case. How do you know that this is going on in other urgent care centers? Because I, I know of the centers, I know of the people involved, and I know of the practices involved. And I know what I did to um, keep things safe. Okay. So this is obviously uh, was a problem in, in your area. Do you have any evidence that this is a, a national issue? Uh, I mean, we know that urgent care centers are growing and we know that uh, there are chains of urgent care centers. Are you saying that that is happening across the country? Or what, what, can, you, what can you tell us? I can tell you that the, in the uh, recent years, there's a good amount of case law that's come out, which highlights this issue. Okay. And, well, we know that every business is for profit unless they're a nonprofit. So we know they're trying to make a profit. But it's your contention that they're putting patients' safety in jeopardy or they're putting it at risk? Yeah. The equation is simple. If I hire a physician assistant, it costs me less money than to hire uh, an MD or a DO. All right. And I mean, you said you've read case law and you've seen some cases. Can you give our listeners maybe an example or two of uh, some really bad things that happened to individuals, especially, and since, you know, we're the injured senior podcast, uh, you know, for seniors or, or elders, as a result of going to uh, an urgent care center where they didn't see a doctor or they saw a, a patient extender or a, or a doctor extender who made a mistake? Sure. One that comes to mind that's relatively recent is a case out of um, Florida. A 75-year-old male had an uh, uncomplicated UTI went to an urgent care, had, uh, and it was missed So, at, and not treated. He was seen by, uh, I think, nurse practitioner who somehow missed the, uh, the diagnosis. Patient got worse, went back to the urgent care, and this time they recognized it. And what they did is they sent him home on an oral antibiotic that um, he would had resistance to the bug, the organism that comprised his UTI. Now the problem here is that, and uh, the reason it was resistant is because he had previously had a UTI a year prior that was treated and found resistant to this particular drug. Now the Extender didn't look back into the records that she had available to her. She didn't realize that the patient's uh, organism was resistant. And, you know, it ended up that this patient died. Oh, God. Yeah. So this patient lost life. And as physicians, 
we know reflexively when it, uh, in a situation like this to look at old records, see what antibiotics the patient has been on previously. Chances are, if the patient had been on a given antibiotic previously, there's a good chance that there's going to be present day resistance. Right. So that, that would not be an antibiotic that you would use. That would not be your choice. In this case, the patient had established resistance to this organism. So that was the problem. And because a lot of these urgent care center franchises or chains, they're looking to really maximize their profits. So do you believe that in general they're understaffed on top of the fact that a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant is not a doctor, uh, they also might be seeing more patients than they should be seeing. Could that have also factored into uh, this uh, horrible tragedy down in Florida? Oh, certainly. Definitely. But, you know, Steve, you know, I want to be clear in that um, nurse practitioners, PAs, and MDs, we all have our place. We all have, you know, legitimacy in, in the uh, healthcare system. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not being, you know, putting down extenders. What I'm saying is that they're being misused. Got it. And that's, and that's good. That is really, really important information because uh, I'm sure a lot of our senior and elderly community that, that listen to this show at some point are going to consider going to an urgent care center. You're not saying don't go to an urgent care center. What you're saying is that be aware that you, you might walk into a center that might not be at the top of their game because uh, of the, the, the things that you've been talking about during this show. Is, is, that, is that accurate? Sure. And, you know, what a, a person can do is um, to call ahead to the urgent care, get an idea of the lay of the land. If there's a physician on call, if there's a physician in the facility, um, you know, it's perfectly okay, for example, if there is a physician on premise and the person also, you know, sees a, a PA or an NP, you know, if they're collaborating properly, that's perfectly okay. But if the extender is going to be the only person in the facility, well, then maybe choose another facility. And is it realistic to expect them to tell you that there is or there isn't a doctor on staff or, or, or presently in the facility? Well, I think most often people are going to tell the truth. Yeah. I would hope. Right. Right. No, I, I, I'm with you. Uh, I, again, I'm just looking out for our, our population. So right. yeah, you, you can go, you can go to an urgent care, but call ahead. Would it also make sense to check the Better Business Bureau or go online and see if there's been any problems with that particular franchise or chain or, or urgent care center? Oh, absolutely. They, uh, um, there's, it's very easy to find the reputation of a given place online, as you know. Okay. So we're going to give thumbs up to urgent care centers, but with an asterisk. And you just need to be aware uh, that um, if you're going to go in there with something that could be a serious situation, that you got to make sure that there's going to be a doctor on site to take a look and oversee uh, the, the nurse practitioner uh, or the physician's assistant. Would, would that be right? Yes, for sure. Okay. Do you have any other tips or advice to our injured senior population that's listening to this uh, podcast as far as urgent care centers are concerned? You know, I, I think it's important that uh, any physician that you see is board certified. I would, you know, I, I know that might be sound a little bit much, but I think it's important. And I think it's important that if you are going to go to an urgent care, 
it's very reasonable to um, ask if the people that are going to see you, if they are board certified in either family medicine, internal medicine, or emergency medicine. That's an additional safeguard. And can you just briefly tell our listeners how you become board certified or, or what exactly board certified means? Sure. First, a doctor doesn't have to be board certified to practice in any state. On the other hand, after a doctor completes trainings, for example, internal medicine training, which is a year of internship and two years of residency, after that, they sit for an exam. And if they pass that exam, basically, that's when they're given what we call board certification. And the significance of that is that the doctor has mastered his craft. You know, instead of, you know, not taking, preparing for and being diligent in in studies and in going through residency and internship, and, you know, they are diligent, they prepare themselves, they are technically knowledgeable about the particular field. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So the the board certified physicians are the cream of the crop. Yeah, definitely. Okay. They're actually, you know, Steve, they're actually, it's, you know, it's not that, you know, it's, it's kind of a bare bones requirement in my view. And in most people in my shoes, our view is that's being board certified is kind of a bare bones requirement. Okay. But is there a high percentage of physicians that are board certified? I, I would say over 50% are board certified. Okay. So when you call the urgent care center, you want a board certified physicians, you want the 50% that are probably a, a, a little more better prepared and better qualified because they've been keeping up and they've been honing their craft and they've been tested it showed that they know what they're what they're doing right absolutely okay well that's that's really really good valuable stuff and that's an action step that i think everyone listening uh, needs to do uh, if you're going to go to an urgent care center joe my God, uh, I, I think we're at the end of our time. I can't believe it. I just, just it's wow. almost like I just got on the phone with you. Um, we are very, very grateful for coming in and exposing, you know, a situation with urgent care centers that people need to be aware of. They shouldn't be afraid to go to urgent care centers, but they should know that some urgent care centers are overextended as far as not having sufficient physician personnel on location, not all of them, but some of them. So you just need to call and, and make sure that there's a physician there. And he, sh- he or she should be board certified. So like I said, that is just stuff that I didn't know. I'm 58 and I've gone to uh, urgent care centers and never even once thought about whether or not you know, the doctor was board certified. And sometimes I didn't even know if the person coming in was a doctor. I'm, I, as you can tell, I'm pretty inquisitive. So I probably, you know, interrogated them, but I, I did not know that information. And I'm so glad that you came on to, uh, to tell us about, you know, that conundrum that that could happen. So, Joe, so if uh, someone wants to learn more about urgent care centers or has some questions about it. I know that, you know, obviously you've got a great website with some really good articles that you've written, not only about urgent care centers, but also about uh, infectious diseases on uh, some of the medications that people are taking, how they could be dangerous. So I I highly recommend that people go to your website. What what is that web address? It's Dr. J.F.G consulting.com. You said JF, F is in Frank, G yeah. is in girl? Yes. Consulting.com? Yes. That's awesome. And can you tell our injured senior community what social media platforms you're on? I am on Facebook and LinkedIn. Okay. And what is it under on Facebook and what is it under on uh, LinkedIn? Both are under my name. 
All right. So just type in Joseph Grillo and, uh, and they can find you. Yes. All right. Well, uh, again, thanks so much for coming on, uh, Joe. And we're going to have you on again because uh, there are some other really fascinating topics that you address that I found uh, reading the articles on your website. So we're going to have you back to talk about those issues as well. So folks, if you have any questions about an injury as a senior or elderly person, or if you're the loved one or child of a injured senior or elderly person, maybe somebody who went to an urgent care and was not able to get the basic care that they uh, are supposed to get and something happened to them, feel free to give me a call so or send me an email and I'll be happy to take a look at it and talk to you about it. You can email me at info, I-N-F-O, at injuredseniorhotline.com. Our website, the National Injured Senior Law Center, uh, website is www.injuredseniorhotline.com. And if you'd like to audition to be a guest on the Injured Senior Podcast, such as telling your story as an injured senior or elder or as the child or loved one of an injured senior or elder, again, email me at info at injuredseniorhotline.com. Also, if you like the content, and we had some great content today from Dr. Grillo, if you want to take a look at the show notes, yeah, just head on over there and you'll see the, the notes that our expert note taker took about this uh, episode and yeah head on over there you're always free to reach out to me again to discuss anything that is mentioned on these shows and you have my uh, email address finally please subscribe to this podcast whatever platform you listen whether it be apple spotify stitcher google Go ahead, uh, go on over there and type in Injured Senior Podcast and then subscribe. And then if you could give us a rate and review, that would be awesome. And believe me, the reviews are really important because I want to get some feedback on what everybody's thinking about uh, our show and uh, always looking for suggestions to improve the show. This is your show, so please feel free to to let me know your, you know, what you're thinking and your thoughts. So thanks again for listening to today's show. Be sure to tune in to next week's show. I will talk to you next week. Be safe. Thanks for listening to the Injured Senior Podcast with Steve H. Heisler. If you enjoyed the podcast, please rate, subscribe, review, and share on Apple, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. To find out more or to get help anytime, go to InjuredSeniorHotline.com or call 855-622-6530. We'll see you next time.